Hey everybody, my name is Matt Yoakum. I'm back here again today with Pro Sound Effects, and today we're gonna to be talking about freelancing. So I'm not gonna be diving into Pro Tools today, but I wanted to take some time to talk about freelancing and sort of the basics, the ins and outs of it, like a freelancing 101, uh, just for anybody who's getting started or is very early in their freelancing career or is maybe thinking about jumping into freelance. It can be a little daunting. Uh, I know it was certainly a scary decision when I decided that I was going to give up a stable paycheck in order to freelance. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that I had in the beginning that I didn't have somebody I could go to and ask right out of the gate. So I hope to just provide my perspective. I do, of course, just want to give the caveat that anything I say today about freelancing really is just what has come from my own personal experience. The thing is, everybody has a different way of running their business. The whole point is that you create a system that is consistent and works for you and your clients. Uh, so, you know, but really I'm just gonna be talking about the basics here. So hopefully these general concepts will just help out in general as you look to set yourself up for success as a freelancer. Okay, so to cover some general tips and concepts for getting started, one of the most important things to always keep in mind when you're looking to get into the freelance world is that networking is key. And one of the most important parts about this is that this never stops being the case, not from day one, not from year 10. Uh, network is how you sustain your work. It's, it's, it, it's the web of people that you build moving from job to job to job to ensure that you always have a base that you can reach out to or that can reach out to you in order uh, to sustain your life as a freelancer, right? It's because if you don't know anybody as a freelancer, it's really hard to get people to connect with you. And so that actually leads me directly into my second point, which is that utilizing something like a social network to network when you don't know anybody already is a great way to get started. Just from a personal anecdote, one of the ways that I got going was when I first moved out to LA, I didn't know anybody that could get me started in the business. I mean, I, I had quite literally zero connections. So I came out here, I started looking for any post house that would take me on. And then once I got a job with a stable paycheck where I was just a runner, you know, washing dishes, parking cars, getting lunches for clients, uh, I would then go home and jump onto the different social media networks uh, and try to find people who needed an independent freelance sound designer so I could try my hand. Uh, I was often looking for things like short films uh, because those were a great way, especially if you have like a university or a college near you where students are creating work. That's a great sort of low stakes environment where you can get started. Um, and lots of people will post that stuff on Facebook, uh, on Instagram. Uh, there's also um, a few Slack channels out there where people are pretty involved. And uh, thirdly, actually, I, you know, being in the United States, I used Craigslist a lot. There's a gigs section on there where I would go to Los Angeles and I would just type in sound in the search field. And I would just look for people that would, you know, be looking for somebody that needed sound on some sort of short film project. And of course, I would make sure it was for post since that's my area of focus. But that's how I got started. So it's really just about sort of utilizing the power of something like the internet to start making little connections. And it kind of actually brings me full circle back to my first point about networking being key. One thing to keep in mind when you're getting started is that no client is too small, especially in the beginning. When you don't know anybody, and you start working for random people that you may find on random short films, you never know who has a connection or who might refer you based on the work that you do for their short film. And vice versa, you know, if, if you do not such a great job or you don't have a good attitude, that person may have known somebody they could refer you to and then they decide not to. Of course, you always want to treat every client, no matter how big or how small, with an equal amount of respect and dedication to their project. Because somebody who's just starting out and making a short film to try to, you know, create a piece of art for themselves, 
that is the most important thing that they're doing at the time. So you should treat it as the most important thing that you're doing at the time because that's how they see it. And when you meet their craft with your craft with the same level of respect and passion that they're putting into their work, they'll recognize that. And the best compliment that you can possibly receive as a freelancer is to have that person, that client, turn to a friend who's working on a project and say, oh, I know a guy and you should go and reach out to him or her and use them because they did a great job for me. And that is the way that your network expands and you never know what sort of opportunities that might land you. So just always keep that in mind. Treat every client the same. Uh, the third point that I would make is that you should, especially in the beginning, use your job to help invest in your expanding tool set. So like one time I was asked to uh, clean up some dialogue on a short film and you know, they had a pretty low budget. I didn't have a whole lot of money at the time. And I also knew how to use the isotope tools but couldn't afford them for myself. So, you know, I, what I actually worked out with that filmmaker in that instance was I said, you know, I'll clean up the dialogue in your film, but I need this tool set and it costs about what your budget had. I think I got like the isotope standard or essentials bundle or something at the time. And I said, you know, if you can't, if you're willing to, you know, purchase this software for me in advance, I can use it to do a good job in your film. And so that was a way that I sort of invested. Now, you know, I had keep in mind my stable job on the side to help that income, but I knew on this side project that I would then have a tool set that I could use on every single project moving forward from then on. Similarly, even today, every time I start a new project, one of my favorite things to do is to purchase one or two or three new sound effects libraries so that I can continue to expand my collection. Pro Sound Effects is a great way to do that because, you know, they're hosting and curating recordings and subject material from different recordists and award-winning sound designers and you can then take their material and same thing you know I purchased a library one time with a chunk of money that I have from a total budget of a project and I now have that library forever that I can use on all of my future projects so definitely keep that in mind continue to invest in yourself that's how I've built the studio around me that's how I've built my sound library that's how I've really built everything that I've got is just from continually investing into my craft to be able to do a better and better job each time. And then, you know, similarly along that thread, sometimes as a freelancer, it's important to understand not every project that we work on is thrilling. Some projects are going to be amazing experiences and you're going to absolutely love the people you're working with. You're going to love the subject matter of the film. You're going to love everything about the project and you'll learn a ton, develop a bunch of new techniques. It's just going to feel like a win across the board. Then there's going to be projects from time to time where you're not having such a great time. Maybe the filmmaker you're working with isn't happy with what you're doing, or maybe, you know, they're kind of just difficult to deal with or have unrealistic expectations. Maybe the other crew you're working with are difficult to work with and you're unsure of how to navigate that space. Maybe you just don't really care for the quality of the film that you're working on. It's all good. One of the most important things about being a freelancer and working in any creative field, really, is that you can learn something from every single project you touch. And what I mean by that is, on the great projects, sometimes it can be really obvious what you've learned, right? I learned how to use this plugin in a new way that I hadn't discovered before, and now I have a whole new idea for how to make some design. Or maybe I learned a new way to organize my session to make things really efficient. And then you might work on a project that's not so great, but one of the things that you can learn from that experience is, A, how to deal with the challenges of the people around you and how to keep them happy under sometimes difficult circumstances. Uh, you can learn how you don't want to structure things for yourself. Let's say you've got a supervisor above you or a boss or just some, some other crew member you're working with where you don't like the way the thing is laid out or you, you don't like the way the time has been managed. Well, great. You've just learned something new. You've just learned how you don't want to organize something or how you don't want to manage the time, how you don't want to manage other crew members. So every project has a learning aspect to it, good or bad, and you can use all of the cumulative things that you accrue over the course of your career to help shape 
what you consider to be your ideal set of circumstances and way of running things as a freelancer. And along that end as well, one of the things that's crucial to being a freelancer is always being willing to adapt. Sometimes we work in situations that are challenging or with people that are challenging or with budgets or time constraints that are challenging. And being willing to adapt, to shift the way that you do something in order to accomplish a task, no matter what is set against you, will ultimately make you a stronger sound designer, freelancer, whatever you want to be. This kind of is sort of general advice that applies to most things in life, right? The people who succeed the most are the people who are able to pivot and go with the flow and keep things moving. And that's ultimately what keeps a client happy and also gains the respect of the people around you. When you're able to take a curveball and shift it into a direction that actually works out just fine. So that covered a bunch of the broad strokes in terms of talking about how to be a freelancer, right? Uh, but now I know people have specific questions on how to uh, determine things like your rate, how to hook in that client so that they'll trust you enough to work on the project, etc. So the next section that I'll focus on now is going to be how to negotiate for the gig. So what I mean by negotiating the gig is that any time there's a circumstance where somebody wants you to work on their project or you want to work on somebody else's project, there's going to be some sort of initial conversation that takes place, a negotiation of sorts, where you're going to figure out a couple of key elements that have to do with the film or the project at hand. So one of the first questions that most people will bring up is, what's your availability or what's your schedule? So I personally keep a really structured calendar. It's really important as a freelancer to be able to get good at managing your time. So keeping a, a tight grip on your calendar, whatever system you want to use, whether it's the Apple calendars, the Google calendars, some other app, it's important to manage your schedule and to set expectations because if you don't and you're messy, things are going to overlap in a way or maybe you have a hole in your schedule you didn't realize was there that suddenly you don't have work to fill with. So be on top of your calendar. The second question that you're always going to want to ask the filmmaker is what is the scope of work? What are you being asked to do? Are you being asked to be a sound effects editor where you're just going to be cutting hard effects? Are you being asked to create original bespoke design? Is there some creature or magic element in the in the picture where you're going to need to create all new stuff? Uh, are you going to be doing dialogue editing? Are you expected to supervise? Is there going to be fully needed? What's the ADR situation? You know, who's going to be mixing this thing? Where is it taking place? All of this is encompasses the scope of work so that you understand right out of the gate before the conversation moves any further, what's being expected of me? What do you expect from me as a freelance sound person? Especially as a freelancer in the indie world, a lot of us wear a lot of hats, a lot of us fill a lot of the jobs ourselves and work on different aspects of it. Uh, and so, you know, outside of the union world, somebody might email you, especially young filmmakers or people who maybe just aren't as experienced, they'll use terminology that... Uh, isn't maybe familiar to them and so they'll throw out terms and not really know what it is that they're asking for and so you need to do a little bit dig of digging to figure out what the scope is one just one easy example is i have people reach out fairly frequently and they'll say yeah i need a sound mix for my film it's so, okay so you know in my mind you know you need a mix okay well so one of my first questions always back to that question is you said that you need a sound mix. Does that mean that you've already had a supervisor, somebody who's done the sound effects? Is the dialogue edited? You know, how much of the work has already been completed on the sound? Uh, and if and if that's already been taken care of, then yeah, I'm happy to mix your film. And more often than not, when somebody's asking for a sound mix, they're real. They'll really come back and say, "No, no, I need somebody to do all of that." And you go, "Okay, okay." So there is sometimes a disconnect in terms of the terminology that we understand on the sound side and the terminology that a filmmaker or you know some producer or somebody who's not actually involved in the creative process who reaches out uh, thinks a sound mixer or a sound designer is. 
it's always important to ask these questions because the scope of work is going to determine whether it's realistic to fit into the schedule and whether it's going to fit into the budget, which is obviously the next important piece that we have to talk about. Okay, so talking about budgets can be a difficult subject to navigate because, you know, especially for a lot of people, the subject matter of money can be a touchy thing. The thing that you should keep in mind as a freelancer is that, you know, you are here to provide a service and your service and your time providing that service has a value. Now, determining exactly how much that's worth can be challenging and can be a big question mark, especially when you're just getting started and you don't have a frame of reference. So it's really difficult to say starting out if you should be making $15 an hour, $30 an hour, $50 an hour, $100 an hour. It really is dependent on a multitude of factors. But when I was first starting out freelancing, something that worked well for me and continues to work well for me today is when somebody approaches me with a project and we've explained the scope of what's needed, I will then ask them, what is the budget that you had in mind? Half of the time, they will come back to you and say, we have this number. For this short film, we have $2,000. I'm just going to throw out random numbers here. These are not you know, specific to any project. We have $2,000, and that's going to cover everything. The sound effects, the foley, the dialogue, and the final mix, and the final deliverables. Now, let's say they said that they wanted to be working on the film for, you know, four weeks. Well, $2,000 over four weeks, you figure, okay, that's $500 a week. So it's now up to you. Are you, is your time, if if you're going to be the person wearing all the hats, if you're going to be doing all this work, is it going to be worth your time for $500 a week to cover this for four weeks? Maybe, let's just say it's not. Let's say, you know, you could write back to them and say, well, I'll give you two weeks of my time for that $2,000 because then I can pay myself $500 for the week. I can pay a sound effects editor to help me for $500 a week. Uh, and then over the course of those two weeks, we can get your film done. That's just a really, really loose example. I mean, these numbers, I'm really just pulling them out of air. It's just about the thought process behind how much is your time worth? Are you going to need crew? Are you going to need a space to work in? Are you going to need to invest in expanding your tool set, such as a specific library or plugins that you may need for this job? So you got to keep all these things in mind, but it does help to start by asking them for a budget. They may come back to you and say, we don't have a number in mind. What's your rate? Then this is the little bit more of a tricky part of it. It can be a guessing game. The thing about working on independent and especially small projects is there can be an extremely wide variety of budgets out there. You may work on a 10 minute short film and they may have $500 total for the whole post sound job. Or you may work on a 10 minute short film and they may have $5,000 for the for the post sound job. It's it's really a huge variety and a huge range depending on the scope of work, the quality of the film, whether they've had investment behind it. So you need to just throw out a number that you're comfortable with as a minimum and then let them come back and you can negotiate back and forth in there. Let's say you say I'll do this short film for a thousand dollars, you know, I can I can get it back around to you in about a week's time. And they come back and they say, We're sorry, we've only got five hundred dollars. Now you don't have to just say, Oh, okay, well, five hundred dollars, either no, I can't do it, or yeah, I would love to. You can say, All right, well, a thousand dollars is my normal minimum. Could you meet me somewhere in the middle and say 750 would you be able to make that work and a lot of times if you show that you're willing to negotiate on your side they'll usually work with you and negotiate on their side and if not and they say no we really only have 500 dollars to do this short film at that point you just have a decision to make on whether it's worth your time and you can politely decline and offer to pass the job off to somebody else or you can accept and take on the job and you know, evaluate at the end of that project whether you feel it really was worth taking the pay cut to work on this and make a new connection. Especially in the beginning, sometimes those connections are worth more than the dollar amount as long as you're still able to bring in the income that you need to survive. So just to recap the budget part of it a little bit, 
it is good to understand, you know, how much your time is worth on a daily, on a monthly, on a weekly basis, uh, and to understand, you know, how much crew you're going to need, and then to always remember that you can negotiate back and forth. Most numbers coming from producers aren't extremely solid or rigid, and if they are, they'll typically tend to tell you that that's the case uh, when when you start discussing money. They may say, we just have a firm number and we can't budge from here, or you can do a bit of negotiating and determine that value proposition for yourself. Two other things that are just important that go into uh, back back to the scope of work a little bit that I forgot to mention are you want to understand what the end goal is for this product. Is this going to be played at a festival? Is this going to be played on the web as like a YouTube or a Vimeo uh, thing? Is it just going to be something for their website? Maybe it's just a passion project. Understanding that will also help you understand the scope of the project. And then one of the most important things to establish as well when you're talking about schedule and the budget is how many revisions do you plan on limiting your client to? A very common thing to do is to say, you know, I'll give you three revisions for the editorial side of this process, and I'll give you three revisions for the mix side of this process. And what that means is you'll cover all of the editing that needs to take place. You'll put in the sound effects. You'll do the sound design. You'll send version number one to the client. They'll review it, and then they'll come back to you with a list of notes, right? So you'll hit those notes, and then you'll send back version two. At that point, they'll send you back, you know, hopefully a smaller list of notes if you've addressed the ones prior to them and they're happy with the direction it's moving in. And then you will send them back a version three. At that point, this is their last chance. If you've, if you've established this rule in writing ahead of time of three versions, uh, this is their last chance to get in those final nitpicky notes to make sure that everything's perfect. One thing that's extremely helpful to do in this case is to make sure that when you are exchanging communications with your filmmaker, whether it's the producer, the director, the editor, whoever's involved, that you do so in writing. One of the best and easiest ways to stay organized, at least for myself, is to do all of this work-related stuff over email. And one thing to do as a safeguard is, let's say a director is texting you saying, hey, you know, I know we just finished version three, uh, but I just have like four more notes. If we could please go over those, you know, I'd really appreciate it, is to say, sure, would you mind sending this to me in an email, please? And that way you've got a source of everything documented in writing where you then need to say either, you know, the original thing that we agreed on was three revisions and then it was going to be an extra amount of money after that per revision. Um, or you can just say, you know what, these notes feel like they'll only take five minutes. I'd be happy to do that for you. It's a judgment call for you to make on, you know, how important you think uh, these notes are, how long they'll take, uh, whether, you know, this director is going to be something that you're going to want to keep working with, etc. There's a bunch of sort of smaller variable nuanced things in there to consider. Um, but keeping everything in writing is absolutely crucial to protecting yourself. There have been situations where, for example, I was working on a film one time and we agreed up front that I was going to create a festival version of this film and deliver a 5-1 mix and that we were not going to need to do an M&E. For those of you who don't know, quickly, the m and &E is the version of the film that goes out to distributors where all of the English or the native language of the film has been removed so that foreign territories can overdub it and play it in their native language in their territories. Um, so on this particular film, it was a festival runner. There was no distribution company lined up yet. And they said, uh, you know, we're not going to need an M&E on this. And I was like, okay, that's great. So the price that we set was to do the film and to deliver the festival mix. And that was it. So at the end of the process, they come back to me and say, yeah, so um, when do you think you're going to be able to get that M&E to us? And I said, no, sorry, uh, we actually agreed that 
uh, we were just going to be doing the editorial and the final mix side. Uh, the M&E is going to be an additional budget thing after the fact. And they said, no, we, we always do M&Es for all the films that we do. And so they basically fought back and said, no, you know, we wouldn't have agreed to that. This is something normal for us. We always do an M&E. We need you to take care of this. And thank goodness I had this email saved in the folder for the project that it was assigned to and was able to quite literally re-forward them the email where we had originally discussed some six months prior that no M&E was going to be taking place for this film. And they ended up having to pay me uh, an extra amount in order to take care of that work, which is completely fair because as a freelancer, you know, what you set up in your original negotiations is what should be adhered to for the rest of the film. Now, again, as I said, it's your prerogative and it's up to you to decide if you want to make you know, do a small additional favors or something along the way. Uh, Just, I would always caution you to avoid being taken advantage of in some of these situations. But, you know, I had in writing safeguarded a piece of writing from the producer saying this wasn't going to be necessary. And so, you know, that my time is valuable as a freelancer. I have other projects that, you know, are going to be requiring my time. And I'm not going to be doing that sort of work for free. I mean, an m e can take a day or two or three, and that's valuable time that could be used on another project. So always protect yourself, cover yourself by having everything in writing. And if you feel it's so necessary, even draw up like a small contract and say, you know, you, you can have things that are agreed to on there, such as the final date of delivery, where you say, I'm going to stop working on this on this date. And if we're not done by then, then, you know, it's going to be additional fee per week or per day or however you want to lay that out. Or you just go with a much looser timetable and say, we'll just do it based on revisions. Uh, There may be other small considerations for things like if you want to get paid up front a certain percentage so that you could pay yourself or crew or somebody else working with you on the project and then get like a final amount at the end. Or you may just wait to get one lump sum at the end. And then, yeah, like I said, if if you need a small contract to say, you know, I'm stopping on this date or you have this many revisions or, you know, this is the amount that we've agreed on and it does or does not include certain aspects. You know, maybe you're agreeing to give them a stereo mix and not a 5-1 or you're agreeing to give them 5-1 but not Atmos, etc. These are the sorts of details that all get, you know, worked on in this initial uh, negotiation of the scope of work. And, you know, as long as you've got it in writing, there's a fair chance that you should be able to protect yourself uh, and it's good practice to stay organized that way. I hope that a lot of this has been helpful, especially to those of you who have questions when you're just getting started out, you're nervous about what questions to ask, what to do, what not to do. You know, it is an interesting and sometimes terrifying world to dive in to. I remember being extremely terrified when I was first diving into it because I just wasn't sure. Um, But you know, it really just takes gaining experience at the end of the day the more you do it the more confident you'll become Uh, just make sure that you understand that you do have value as an artist and you have value in your time and the craft that you bring to the table Um, and you know if you have any questions please feel free to reach out and i wish you all the best of luck in your journey into becoming a freelancer Also, just want to give a big shout out once again to Pro Sound Effects. If you're a freelancer who's just starting out, an invaluable resource is to check out like their search program, uh, which is known as SoundQ, which will allow you access into their library. Having a library such as the ones that Pro Sound Effects provide are invaluable as creative tools to be able to use in the projects as you're starting out freelancing using quality sounds from award-winning sound designers such as Richard King, Mark Mangini, Richard Anderson, and so on and so forth. So be sure to check that stuff out. It'll definitely help you as you're getting started in your career.